Welcome back, everybody, and we will now uh, go on with the uh, last of the three uh, lectures by Florian, and uh, I already see some announced Jupiter uh, or like coding examples. So have fun. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. So welcome back. I want to start by pointing you to some example notebooks that we produced for my machine learning course that I'm regularly given, uh, have given back in Erlangen. And you can find these examples by going to the GitHub page of myself, Florian Marquardt, Machine Learning for Physicists repository. You will see many different Jupyter notebooks, starting with the very basics of machine learning, <laughs> programming a neural network on NumPy and so on. But um, I want to point out a particular type of example, which is just applying policy gradient in this case to solve a maze. And so the idea is something like you generate a maze like this and your little robot has to find its way. And you can do this in many different variations. In particular, you can say it's always the same maze but maybe my robot starts at random locations and has to find the exit or has to find some treasure chest. Yeah? Or you could say, no, my robot should develop a strategy in arbitrary mazes to, to know what it's doing. And that has a big influence on how you can set up the solution, namely if it's Namely, if it's always the same maze, then the state could be just the location of the robot, because it's always the same maze. So once it knows its location and somehow it has learned to go around in this maze, it will know where to move. And in that case, you can actually encode the policy, that is the conditional probability of action given state, in a table. You just make a table that is as big as this image of the labyrinth, and there are four actions, then there will be four such tables, and these are the probabilities, and you can train them. And this is what is shown in this first tutorial. So if you go to this GitHub page and you download 07 tutorial maze policy gradient, that is policy gradient applied to finding your way in one given fixed maze. And the beauty of that uh, uh, tutorial is that Here's the policy gradient algorithm, the full learning of everything in 124 lines of pure Python code, as it says here. So the advantage is you can really go through every line yourself and understand it, and it's really the minimal example I can think of here. Okay. Now, if you want to go to, and then you can run it, and it's being visualized, and so on and so on. Um, now, if you want to be able to solve arbitrary mazes, then the input to the robot probably has to be something like an image of the maze, and then it should look at the labyrinth and say, oh, yeah, I should go this way and that way, in which case you need a neural network. And so this is shown in other tutorial examples here. Let me just quickly go there. So uh, here's 08 tutorial. Uh, using deep policy gradient. Deep stands for deep neural network. And uh, you can go through it again, of course, a little bit longer. Uh, but this first attempt didn't yet work that well. And uh, there's another version of that 09 homework, improve maze deep policy gradient. And so that is really uh, applying a convolutional neural network to an image of the labyrinth going through several steps and then spitting out the action probabilities, similar to what we saw for AlphaGo going through a convolutional neural network. And that eventually works uh, fairly well, and then you can play different variants of the game. Here we have variants where there are treasure chests hidden in, in the labyrinth, and you have to pick one after the other and stuff like this. So I really invite you to go to this uh, GitHub page, download these Jupyter notebooks, go through them, uh, try to understand the code, but that's something you have to do yourself or in little teams, so I will not now do it online. Uh, you just do it yourself. 
Okay. So now I want to spend the last 80 minutes or so of this lecture series on giving you a few examples of applying reinforcement learning which are taken from our research. So you really see how this works out when you want to apply it to quantum problems and they become non-trivial. Okay, so uh, can we design better quantum computers is the overarching question by having a classical neural network interact with my quantum computer. And there are many aspects, even beyond reinforcement learning, where classical machine learning can be useful for quantum technologies. Maybe you discussed parts of this already during uh, the rest of the lectures uh, this week, but let me nevertheless summarize it. So here you have your little quantum device, could be a quantum computer, a quantum simulator, or a single quantum sensor. You want to control it via machine learning. And what are the tasks that you could try to solve? Well, for one thing, um, maybe you just want to simulate your quantum device. And maybe it's complicated because it consists of many qubits. Um, so even to represent the quantum state is difficult. And you may have already heard something about it, you will certainly hear, some, hear something about it later. So neural network quantum states are one uh, example application of machine learning to simulate these quantum devices. And then you could also just be staring at this noisy measurement data, so voltage versus time, very noisy, and you want to interpret it. You want to figure out is this qubit in state one or zero despite all the noise and despite all the non-idealities in your quantum device, so it doesn't behave maybe perfectly like you would want to think in simulations. And you can train a neural network to do this in a classical kind of uh, classification task. Or maybe you have fabricated your quantum device and it, you know roughly which Hamiltonian it should obey, but it's not quite there. There are unknown parameters. You want to figure them out in an efficient manner. And again, machine learning can help. And then on the other side, there's the discovery of strategies. So you could go down to the hardware level and uh, imagine in a kind of quantum control setting, what are the best pulse shapes that I have to send down to my quantum device to, for example, even just do a single gate like flipping the qubit from down to up. Or you could say, once I have these gates, can I stitch them together in a quantum circuit, maybe even including some measurements and feedback to discover a good quantum circuit or quantum protocol involving feedback. Maybe you want to even discover the whole experimental setups. So these are the things that may be uh, tackled with reinforcement learning. And if you want to read a recent kind of very brief review of the whole field of classical machine learning for quantum technologies, I direct you to this perspective article that we wrote last year. Okay. So now let's go to reinforcement learning. Ah, yeah, I still wanted to advertise what we are doing in our group. So uh, yes, we are doing machine learning for quantum technology, but we are also applying machine learning, say, to uh, optimize photonic systems, uh, figuring out how photonic crystals should look like, to do what you could call in general artificial scientific discoveries. So for example, you're staring at a very complex system with its complicated dynamics. Can you discover such things as what's the best representation of the system? Uh, or also we are uh, turning things around and looking at how to use physics to produce better machine learning devices. Uh, the keyword here is neuromorphic computing. How can you replace digital neural networks with uh, something more analog? Okay, so this picture you've all seen already, uh, reinforcement learning consists of an agent and an environment, but how would we apply this to a quantum device? And so here's the thing I'm thinking of. Uh, here, for example, you would have a couple of qubits. Um, you can decide to measure them. That would be something like an observation that your agent takes in. And then, possibly based on a neural network, your agent decides on the suggested actions, and then you apply these actions and in such a setting, the actions could be like quantum gates. So you decide to flip one qubit or to apply a controlled knot between two qubits. 
And then you would have to define a reward and tell me what is the task that you are really trying to achieve. And so here's uh, one interesting question already. Do we have a model of the world? Do we have a model of the environment? I briefly mentioned it in the very beginning. Sometimes in physics we actually have this model, yeah, because it's the Schrödinger equation, for example, for quantum physics. But even though that may be the case, uh, to apply that model can still be difficult because uh, in order to really apply the Schrödinger equation, I know, need to know the exact details of the parameters in the Hamiltonian, so I need to calibrate my experiment. Not only do I need to calibrate the uh, parameters in the Hamiltonian, but maybe also all the technical details of how the signals travel along the control lines and so on. So it can be fairly complicated. And therefore, it is uh, useful also in this setting where, in principle, we know the Schrodinger equation to apply these model-free reinforcement learning techniques that we discussed before, where uh, technically, from the point of view of the algorithm, your quantum system is treated like a black box and it reveals its uh, effects only via the interaction with the agent. So the agent says, I do this action, then the environment uh, spits out uh, another observation for the next round. So in this way, the agent does learn uh, what's going on, but only implicitly. It does not make use of a model. Okay, and so one of the big tasks that we identified as um, being amenable to reinforcement learning is quantum error correction. And why quantum error correction? Well, first, it's an important task in quantum computing because uh, they are subject to noise. If we don't have quantum error correction, we will never have a useful quantum computer. Second, the strategies for quantum error correction are fairly tricky, so they are not completely obvious to a human. Um, so you could try to discover them with reinforcement learning. Also, um, quantum error correction strategies may involve some kind of feedback loop, yeah, because you measure and then decide, oh, an error must have happened, I should correct the error, that's a classical type of feedback. And reinforcement learning is very good at feedback because reinforcement learning is about an agent observing its environment and then reacting based on the observations. So that's where we started. And you can ask things like, what's the best quantum error correction strategy in practice for a given hardware platform? It will depend on the kind of noise that is acting on this platform, the available quantum gates, the operations that I can apply, the connectivity between the qubits. And so that's already interesting because even if you know in principle of how quantum error correction works, because Peter Shaw told you in the 90s, then still in every particular hardware platform, there's still a lot to discover and you can use reinforcement learning for that. Okay, and so now I want to go through the first project that we ever did in this domain and it was also the first machine learning project that we ever did as a group. Um, and that was about the following situation. Imagine you have a few qubits, not many, a small quantum module, so to speak. They are subject to some noise, so in principle, quantum information would decohere and decay, and you want to protect it against that noise. And you pretend that you know nothing about quantum error correction. <laughs> so it's the task of the agent to figure things out on its own, which has the advantage that it may figure out also slightly surprising solutions that you would not have otherwise come up with. Okay. So to, to make this really clear, I will formulate it like a game because every reinforcement learning thing is like a game. So at the start of the game, you will initialize one of the qubits in a superposition state. And it's an arbitrary superposition state. And your task is to preserve the superposition state as long as possible, regardless of how it looked like in the beginning. So it's not about um, just um, preserving a known fixed state, that could be easy. You just wait for it to decay and then you uh, recreate it. Yeah? But you have to preserve the state um, that can be arbitrary and so you, you should never lose it because once you lose it, it's gone. Okay, so what can you do? Well, what you can do is obviously apply different quantum gates, maybe do something on single qubits or also do something on pairs of qubits, flip the second qubit state depending on the first qubit state, these kinds of things. And the way we like to represent this is in terms of a quantum circuit. So this will occur again and again in this lecture. 
So a quantum circuit has time running to the right. Every qubit is a different line. And one of these four qubits in this example is the qubit where we put in the arbitrary superposition state, and maybe the others are in their ground state. And now, if I don't know anything, well, I can just start applying quantum gates. For example, a control knot between this uh, qubit with an interesting superposition state and a neighboring qubit. So the neighboring qubit will be flipped depending on whether the first qubit is in zero or one. And so that's the circuit symbol here. I can go on and apply it to other pairs of qubits. I could also apply single qubit gates I'm not showing here. And eventually, maybe I decide to measure. We want to make, make the agent have the possibility to ha have a measurement, because we know that in quantum error correction, sometimes I want to do measurements. So now, if you did decide to measure at this point in time, well, if you think it through and you know your quantum physics, then you know that these controlled knots have entangled the original quantum state with all the rest of the circuit, and this measurement now will completely collapse the quantum state. So instead of preserving it, you have done the opposite. So that would be an exceptionally bad choice. But I'm showing this example because this is exactly the situation that a reinforcement learning fi agent finds itself in in the beginning. It doesn't know anything. It will do apply random actions and it will typically fail in this manner. Yeah. Okay, and so now how could we solve this problem using reinforcement learning? And I will first introduce a naive approach, which is the one that we started with, uh, because we were very enthusiastic. We had read about AlphaGo, and we said, okay, that's great. We can solve any complex problem using these techniques, and we just need to press the button. So uh, we said, let's say, um, what's the reward? Well, the reward could be the overlap of the final state of the qubits, or of that particular qubit that I care about, with the initial state. If that overlap is large, I have preserved my quantum information. And maybe since I want to preserve arbitrary initial states, I run trajectories for arbitrary initial states, and I will average this over initial states, but that's a small detail. Okay. And the policy network, if I think of policy gradient reinforcement learning, uh, would just have the measurement result as an input and then produce the action probabilities as output. And the action probabilities would be, for example, single qubit bit flip, controlled knot, any other kind of uh, quantum gate, and also measurement. And of course, here I simplify already because if there are four qubits, there are many different C knots that I could apply between the first and the second, second and third, and blah, blah, blah. Also bit flip. So there will be relatively many actions already. So now you could let this run, and it will surely produce some random sequences, but it will be completely stuck in these random sequences, actually. So we were very disappointed. All these really powerful <laughs> techniques were not of any use. And so what's going on? What's the problem? Well, the first problem is, that's of course also true for other reinforcement learning setups, but here, it's particularly bad apparently, is a combinatorial explosion of things you can do. So um, the shortest useful gate sequences to encode the quantum information, do detections of possible errors that occur, and then decode the quantum information, that's already fairly long. That could be, I don't know, 30 different time steps at least, or something like this, yeah? And then you also have many different gates at each time step. So if you just do the combinatorics here, I say for 20 possible gates or actions and 10 time steps, you have 20 to the 10 possibilities. Now it may be that there is no, not a unique solution, so maybe there are several that uh, give a good result, but still it's, it's completely crazy. And in the end, we will even be talking about 200 time steps. So there's a large, large space of possible solutions. And, um, and the problem is a little bit, it would be fine if there is one solution which only needs a few gates and does not so good, but already better than nothing, and then you can build on that and improve. But even the shortest uh, solutions that do something useful and recreate the quantum state are already relatively long, so it's very hard to encounter them by sheer luck. Okay, so that's one problem. And the other problem that we then also discovered was local optima. So, of course, that's not very unique to reinforcement learning, 
But in this particular case, what it means uh, concretely is the agent uh, discovers uh, that it's really good to be lazy. <laughs> because if you don't do anything, any gate and any measurement, and you just let the qubit sit there, you're already pretty much better than if you do something. <laughs> so what is, uh, if I want to plot this, here I'm plotting, well, I want to be low, should be good, so I'm plotting the negative return, okay, fine. And so this is the idle strategy. Doing nothing is already a local minimum. And then there is, in principle, something better, but it's a smart and complex strategy. And then there's this long barrier of incomplete strategies where you are not yet quite there and not yet doing quite the right gate sequence. And so that's really tough yeah, to overcome this. Okay. And so the lesson I want to teach by discussing this uh, old work from 2018 is that in many cases, if you are really trying something difficult in physics, you cannot just import the things that computer scientists have invented and then press the button and hope that it works. So you have to put in your knowledge of physics. And so we had here two key concepts that we invented for this purpose. So the first was to put in as much information as possible, and I explain it in a moment, and then also to construct a very smart reward function that is much smarter than the naive thing that we started with. Okay. So the first about the information that you get. In principle, this error correction strategy should work purely based on the measurement results, because we know this. I mean, Peter Shaw taught us in the 90s already how quantum error correction should work. So in principle, these projective measurements of a qubit should be enough to decide, for example, whether an error has happened and I should apply a correction uh, 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 sequence. But if you think about it, these are very rare uh, things. Yeah? So most of the time you're just applying gates and once in a while you're doing a measurement and then you get one or zero and then based on that you have to think about how, uh, what this means. And if I come back to our little robot, this is a, almost as if this little robot is blindfolded and bumping around the maze and only maybe touching the wall that is nearby and not much more. Yeah? It's of course much easier for the robot if you give it the full picture of the whole labyrinth including the positions of all the boxes. Even then, it's not completely trivial because it still has to plan the shortest path to the nearby box, yeah? So it's not trivial, but it's obviously much simpler. And so how can we translate this to, to our setting? Well, we could say, in principle, that instead of being fed only these measurement results, the agent is fed the state, the quantum state of the quantum computer at any given time, and then has to decide what to do. That's certainly more information. That's actually the most information that we can possibly provide. Uh, the problem is, okay, it looks a little bit uh, shaky. It almost sounds like cheating. So, um, so first of all, in an experiment, we will not be able to do this because in an experiment, I cannot somehow stop my quantum computer and then do full quantum state tomography and see which state I have. That's be completely besides the point. In the experiment, I should not, most of the time, not measure the quantum computer and only very rarely measure it. And then we would be back in the, in the old problem. Yeah? So we can do this in simulations, but not in an experiment. So that's something we have to think about. Plus, also, this agent has the task of preserving an unknown quantum state. But now you're giving the quantum state to the agent. So in the worst case, the agent could start to cheat. Initially, it will be given the quantum state, then it memorizes the quantum state, then it lets the quantum state decay, and then after, at the end of the time evolution, it comes and just to a state preparation uh, sequence and recreates the quantum state and says, ha, oh, I was successful. But again, this, this is unfair. In a real experiment, this is not possible. No one tells you this unknown quantum state. That's not the point of quantum error correction. So, yeah, what do we do? So first, we, we tackle this problem that we want to preserve an arbitrary quantum state. So really, instead of really feeding the quantum state itself into the agent, what we're feeding into the agent is, so to speak, the time evolution of arbitrary quantum states, or in more technical language, it's the, it's the map that would map the initial state to the state at some point, time uh, t. Yeah? 
And technically, that's a completely positive map that includes all the dissipation that's going on. And uh, we can then think about how we describe this map. And it's actually not that difficult because we are only considering uh, arbitrary quantum states in this uh, single qubit subspace. So, so it's manageable. And so we will actually feed this completely positive map into the agent. So it cannot then spit out an action that depends on the actual realization of the quantum state. It only knows in a more abstract sense about what's going on. So that's already one trick. But still, this doesn't solve the problem that in an experiment, I have neither access to the density matrix nor, nor to this completely positive map. Yeah? So what we do then is the following, and we call this two-stage learning. So first, in simulations, we train this, what we call state-aware network, which gets the full information. And again, here I pretend I'm feeding the quantum state rho. In reality, I'm feeding this completely positive map. Um, and once this is trained, and because it's so powerful, it does train well, then I go and say, I set up a second network that really would only take measurement results as input. But instead of trying to train that using reinforcement learning, which I already know is very hard, I use my first network, which has become an expert, and I run it on trajectories. And then I try to teach my second network to reproduce these actions, but now only based on the measurement results. Yeah? So the first network that was so powerful has been trained using reinforcement learning. It knows the correct uh, sequence of actions. And the second network tries to mimic those actions, but only based on the few measurement results. So that part is a supervised learning. So a powerful network, really the teacher <laughs> teaches a less powerful network, which however then can be applied in the experiment. So, so that was something that we did and that really worked very well. And in principle, it's something that you can apply much more generally. Yeah? So if you have a reinforcement learning setting where you observe only a small part of the world, and so it's really difficult to, to decide what's the good action. Maybe if you have a simulation available that can give you a much bigger observation, think of a computer game, suddenly you see the whole map of the playing field instead of only the vicinity. You can first train an agent on this um, fully observed uh, environment and then have it teach another network that only takes in these very sparse uh, uh, observations. So that worked really nicely. Now there's one thing here, one technical thing. Um, if you give me the quantum state, that's enough to know what to do. If you give me measurements, you should actually tell me the whole sequence of measurements. So I may need some memory. I may need to memorize, oh, the first measurement five time steps ago, that gave me a one, the other one was a zero. But once you give me this memory, then this is enough information in principle to reconstruct what should have happened. And a network with memory, this is one of those recurrent neural networks. I don't know whether you did discuss that. Yes, you did discuss this. OK, so it's an LSTM network, and it worked really nicely. OK, so this is about the thing about having too little information. We solve this by having a lot of information and then training a network that can do with a little information. Uh, any question uh, about this? Yes? Mm -hmm. um, you're asking about scaling with qubit size? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So. <laughs> It's not by accident that I showed you four or five qubits. So, so um, any technique that tries to figure out strategies for a quantum computer is already limited to some degree by what you can simulate on a classical computer. So that's why I emphasize a small quantum module that I want to improve instead of the whole quantum computer. So that's, uh, first of all, true. Um, then sometimes when can get around this a little bit, depending on the gates that you apply. I will come back to that. So with Clifford gates, it's easier to simulate. But even in, that case, in those cases, it's true that the input to this network is a little bit of a bottleneck. 
we already tried to make it easier on the network. So what we did was not just naively feed the density matrix into the network, but what we did was a um, eigenvalue decomposition of the density matrix and only keep the largest eigenvectors and eigenvalues and only feed those into the network. So that already saves you a little bit, but still there's an exponential part in here. Uh, I'm not sure I'm following the <laughs> exact idea. Oh, uh, so to speak, a quantum reinforcement learning agent. Um, so, I mean, in general, ideas about quantum reinforcement learning exist, but I don't think anyone has done it on this problem, I would say. But we also now have different techniques to tackle the whole problem, so I don't know whether <laughs> it's still uh, relevant. Okay. So second is a smart reward scheme. So obviously, things would be easier for this little robot if instead of just getting a reward when it's already on the box, if there are these little cookies around the box <laughs> and it already gets small rewards. It's a little bit like the Q function, only you would set it up, so to speak, to guide it a little bit. Whenever you can do something like that without too much effort, maybe you should do, you should do that. So for us, what does it mean? So the problem here with our reward, which initially was just the overlap at the final time between the final time state and the original state, is it's a very sparse reward. Only at the very final time you're being told whether you did well or not. And so what will happen is during training, you do some gate sequence. Unfortunately, some of the gates are chosen in the wrong way. And in, uh, in the end, you get an overlap of zero between your initial state and the final state. So you get reward zero. You run it again, again you make some mistake because it's a long sequence, again you get zero. So zero, 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 zero. <laughs> you never get a reward signal actually. You cannot really learn anything from that. So that's a problem. So what you would want ideally is something where even if you do things somewhat right, at least for a few steps, you should already get a reward. So ideally we would want to know in the middle of this complicated gate sequence, how well are we doing? Yeah? How much of the initial quantum information is still preserved? Now there's a problem with that because in the middle of this gate sequence, I cannot simply take the overlap. I cannot take the overlap of this quantum state in the middle of time with the initial uh, uh, state and the reason is the whole point of quantum error correction is to take the initial state and to entangle it in complicated ways and spread it over all the qubits. So the intermediate states will look completely different and the overlap with the initial state is basically zero. Yeah. So the overlap is not good enough. But still, it would be so great to have an intermediate reward that uh, teaches me how much of the initial quantum information is still preserved. But it must be, must, must be more clever. It must be something like, if at this point in time I would do the optimal decoding of this complex entangled state back into the single qubit, then how much would I have an overlap? Yeah? So it's more complicated. And so then uh, my student, Thomas, came up with a really, uh, really nice idea. So the point is this. Um, how, how can I tell how much my quantum information has decayed? Well, initially I only have a single qubit. I'm talking about a single logical qubit. So I can represent that on a Bloch sphere. Um, and then I can, say, pick two opposite directions on this Bloch sphere, say spin up and spin down, qubit up and down, and evolve them according to this complicated quantum circuit. Each of these states will become a very complicated entangled state distributed over many qubits. But I can still ask, how well can I distinguish these two states? If I can distinguish them perfectly by a well-chosen measurement, then probably this means um, in some way, the initial quantum information is still present. If, on the other hand, everything had decayed by now, so everything has to relax to the ground state, then I cannot distinguish them anymore. Actually, both states have become the same state, and then it's bad, obviously. So there is 
a mathematical scheme, if I give you two quantum states, even mixed states, and I say, how well could you distinguish them? If you could optimize the measurement, and the measurement could be arbitrary, and you take the best possible measurement to distinguish them, how well could you still distinguish them? And that's simply by taking the difference of the density matrices of these two states, and then applying the one norms, so it's basically you diagonalize this matrix and take the uh, magnitudes of the eigenvalues and you sum them all up. That uh, has been proven to tell me what's the probability to properly distinguish between these two states in an optimal measurement. And this is then what we took as applied to the initial logical states of the logical qubit uh, to say how much quantum information is still preserved. Uh, we call that the recoverable quantum information. We take the worst case, so depending on the initial state of the logical qubit, maybe sometimes you're doing better and sometimes worse, so we minimize, we take the worst case over the initial uh, Bloch vector direction, and uh, that has proven to be super useful. So this is a quantity that we can calculate at an immediate time, and if there has been no decoherence, regardless of my complicated quantum circuit, I will get one, I will say say this is still perfectly recoverable. Yeah? Even though I wouldn't know at this moment how the recovery sequence, how the decoding would work. So I do not need to discover the de uh, decoding in order to apply this measure. And so with this reward, uh, things then finally worked out. And so here's a few examples. Um, you're having four qubits. Uh, you're training, initially it's almost random. Eventually, it learns how to avoid the catastrophic measurements that collapse everything. In this case, it finds a repetition code, so it encodes the qubits into three. Uh, it encodes the state into three qubits. It discovers that there are smart measurements, but these are the parity measurements. So um, here you would uh, set aside one of the four qubits, and it learns that on its own, it's, you set aside one of the four qubits as an ancilla, you do a controlled knot with two of the qubits and then measure the ancilla, um, and, then, um, and then you can discover whether the two qubits are still the same or whether they have been flipped with respect to each other, which indicates there may be an error and you have to correct it and so on. So this works nicely, and once it works on one simple example, you can now run it really on many different topologies, many different connectivities and gate sets, and for each of them, you can ask how well it is doing and how much the error correction improves the coherence time versus the bare coherence time. This is shown with these, with these bar plots. Um, and then you can go on. You can also do other stuff. You can, so, so these are technically all stabilizer codes and very simple ones at that. But um, you can also say, oh, let me... Uh, introduce some noise which acts in the same way on all the qubits and then it finds very smart adaptive uh, measurement strategies uh, in order to protect one of the qubits by figuring out about the noise from measuring the other qubits and so on. So that's the good thing about it, but um, of course it's not very scalable. So we do discover things from scratch. We do not build in any knowledge of quantum physics or error correction strategies or how quantum computing works. So from the point of view of the agent, it's just being told you have these 20 actions, you have 200 time steps, you get a reward, an intermediate reward, okay. Do your best to improve this reward. Yeah? So that's what it's doing. So it's, uh, the advantage is it's not tied to any of the standard quantum error correction approaches, but it's not at all scalable. So we had then five qubits and six, and then we stopped, so <laughs> it's really hard. Okay, so now how do we scale up? Yeah. And there is a need for scaling up because now we are in an era where uh, there's more and more experiments uh, doing quantum error correction on say 17 qubits, 50 qubits, or so, uh, so um, on a number of qubits that would be beyond that algorithm that I uh, introduced just a moment ago. But it's important to have uh, machine learning techniques to discover better quantum error correction. So, what do we do? Well, uh, I already told you the trick. The trick is inject as much of your knowledge as possible. And that's fair uh, as long as you don't supply the exact solution. Then, of course, there's nothing to be done. But as long as there's still a lot to be done for the reinforcement learning, that's okay. So, for example, we use the known structure of quantum error correction. We know it's usually some encoding part 
then some error detection, maybe some correction, and then some decoding. And so we can split this and say we concentrate on the encoding, for example, and let the reinforcement learning agent only discover this. Also, uh, smart people many years ago already have thought very hard about quantum error correction. And so if I tell you about the noise, which typical kinds of errors will occur, and you tell me which logical qubit states you have prepared, then there's some conditions called nil of lum conditions that you can check, and you say, aha, yes, for these logical qubit states, for these kinds of errors that you said could happen, I will be able to correct these errors. Yeah? Because somehow the errors acting on these logical qubit states may give you new states, but uh, they will never merge the states. That, that, that's the catastrophic thing. Yeah? So if everything decays to the ground state, <laughs> then of course you cannot recover the original quantum information. But if these two, qubits, uh, if these two logical states just turn into still orthogonal logical states, things are good. Okay. And then there's another point. So there's this um, slightly scary exponential scaling even of the simulation. So if you want to train on a simulation that runs on a classical computer and you're trying to simulate a quantum computer, we know already we will be in trouble at some point. Otherwise, there would be no need for quantum computers if they were always classically efficiently simulable. Now, the nice thing is if I concentrate on this large class of so-called stabilizer codes and quantum error correction, which is what Peter Shaw and others invented in the 90s, then I know already in advance that all this um, uh, generation of the logical states initially and also the error detection and so on can be done using so-called Clifford gates. And Clifford gates are the simplest kinds of qubit gates you can think of. So for a single qubit, it's just rotations by 90 degrees. And for two qubits, it's uh, yeah, spiritually still the same 90 degree rotations. And so they can be simulated classically efficiently. We know this, even for many qubits, even hundreds of qubits, if you like. And so at least on the simulation front, we do not have a bottleneck anymore. That doesn't completely solve the combinatorial explosion, of course. I mean, even viewed as a classical problem, if you have many, many possible gates that you can apply on many possible qubits, there are still so many possibilities, but at least the simulations are fast. Okay. And so now I want to show you some of our two of our very most recent uh, works where we have gone to far larger qubit numbers, up to 20, actually. So um, the first setting is described like this. Uh, try to find quantum error correction codes, or more precisely, find the encoding circuit together with the code. And code just means logical qubit states. Yeah. And so the setting that we imagine is you encode your original arbitrary state into some interesting collection of logical qubit states. And then afterwards, there would be noise because you send it across a noisy quantum channel, for example, and you want it to be quite immune against this noise. What this setting means in particular is that during the encoding, the noise does not act. Yeah? So the encoding is assumed to be perfect. So it's really like a quantum communication scenario. Later on, we will worry also what happens if we have noise during the encoding. Okay, so now how do we efficiently describe the actions of such a quantum circuit? So the agent, again, will try to place individual gates like this Hadamard gate and controlled NOT gate and so on. And we want to describe what's going on, but in an efficient way. I don't want to simulate the density matrix or anything, yeah? And so people know about this uh, stabilizer formalism. So. Um, it's a very smart way of describing a quantum state. Instead of storing all the uh, amplitudes uh, of this quantum state uh, as decomposed in some basis, you're just asking, uh, are there some operators for which this quantum state is an eigenstate? And these operators are of a particularly simple type in this setting. So they are just products of Pauli operators. So for example, sigma x on the first qubit, sigma z on the second qubit. Maybe there's an identity on the third qubit. And you want that this state has eigenvalue plus one, OK? That alone would not yet describe the state. If you think about it more closely, you need a, uh, actually precisely, um, if you have three qubits, you need three of these conditions, and then it will fix your state actually precisely. Yeah? 
And so the, the language we use to abbreviate is a little bit like X, Z, and then identity would be one of the so-called stabilizers of the state. And uh, for three qubits, again, there would be three such stabilizers, and then the uh, three qubit state is entirely fixed. And it's a very simple state. Yeah? It cannot be an arbitrary superposition, but um, it's not necessarily just a product state, so it can be more complicated. A GHZ state, uh, this up, 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 plus down, 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 can be represented in this manner. Okay. So this is how stabilizers work. And the uh, efficient way how to then simulate the action of such a quantum circuit is that whenever you apply a gate like controlled not or Hadama, everything that changes is only these stabilizers will change. For example, the X will turn into a Y, or I don't know, the, here there will appear another Z, and so on. So there are very simple rules how these stabilizers change. And uh, again, for three qubits, you only have these three stabilizers that you write down, and each one of the three changes. So suddenly, the effort for doing this um, is no longer exponential, like in the general case, but it just scales uh, in a very simple polynomial way with the number of qubits that you have. Okay. So in our particular setting, we will be interested in generating logical qubits, so to speak, subspaces. One logical qubit would be a two-dimensional subspace. Yeah? Two logical qubits is a four-dimensional subspace. And so to describe such a subspace, if I have six qubits, instead of writing down six poly strings, so this is also called a poly string, instead of writing down six, I will write down five, so I, I lose one. And that gives me a two-dimensional subspace corresponding to one logical qubit. And so these would, you would then call the code generators, the stabilizers of the code. So I have five of these poly strings, and they will define a two-dimensional subspace. And so that defines my quantum code somehow. OK. And so I can simulate this super efficiently. Yeah? So once you apply the next gate, all of the five will change, but in a very simple way. And um, the these stabilizers can be actually translated into bit strings. So you, people write down things like um, uh, if, you, if you had um, five qubits, uh, you could say, I write down a bit string that has a one wherever I have an x in this product. And when I have an identity, I write down a zero. And then you do another bit string uh, where you say, I write down a one whenever I have a z. And if I have a one at both places, at both corresponding places, then it's actually a Y. So this is the way people convert this into bit strings. And if you write down then each uh, stabilizer as one of these bit strings, you actually get a matrix. I don't know how the next one looks like, yeah. Um, and so on. And this is called a tableau. So the whole thing is that you have this binary matrix that you evolve as you apply gate after gate, and it's super easy. OK, so this is how we describe the actions. And that also means if I want to feed the current state of the application of the gates into the agent, all I'm doing is feeding this binary matrix into my agent. Yeah? So that's simple enough. OK, so then what's the whole setting? How, how do we put everything together? So what you specify here for this game is first the error operator. So you tell me. Uh, there might be the possibility that qubit number i uh, can flip from 0 to 1. So that's an xi. That's one of the error operators. Maybe there are also more complicated error operators where two qubits flip at the same time. So you tell me the set of error operators against which you hope to become immune. Yeah. Um, then you also have to tell me what gates are available. Maybe it's controlled not. Maybe it's some other gate. The only constraint here is, has to be Clifford, <laughs> so these kind of 90-degree rotations. But we know from Peter Shaw and others that this is enough for this class of stabilizer codes. Um, and then the qubit connectivity. So that will determine where you can apply these uh, two qubit gates, so where you can apply controlled knots between different qubits. And so that's also an important part. And if you go to IBM, uh, then they will uh, show you the different um, cloud uh, quantum computers that they have available, and each one of them has a different connectivity. OK. And so now how the cycle works of reinforcement learning is 
I have my agent. The agent suggests to apply some gate. I apply the gate, so uh, my quantum circuit is starting to grow. Um, and I will also update my code generators, which started in a very simple initialized state where basically um, all those qubits were in the ground state, so uh, it's just a Z at each of the positions of these uh, qubits. And then it's modified because of the gates that are acting. And then I will feed a representation, as I said, this binary matrix into my reinforcement learning agent, and then it has to decide what's the ne next action. So it's a cycle that is simple enough. Uh, any question uh, at this point? Yeah, at least you understand what's the observation. It's such a binary matrix representing the uh, quantum state, uh, or rather the subspace that I'm in. And the output is the usual action probabilities. OK. Yes, please. Hmm? Say it again. Yes, yes. In, in this type of codes, yes, it's absolutely enough to do Clifford gates. Uh, so for the syndrome detection, where you want to figure out what has happened, and also if you need to for the correction, yes. And uh, this includes a lot. Yeah? This includes the surface code and so on. It doesn't include everything that you could do. Uh, for example, there's the f completely different quantum error correction uh, approaches, say, for bosonic codes, where you talk about harmonic oscillator states and so on. That's a completely different thing. It also ne doesn't necessarily include um, error mitigation techniques, uh, where, uh, OK, may or, or maybe active noise cancellation, where maybe you measure the noise, and then you try to say, oh, if this noise acts on multiple qubits and I've measured the magnet fluctuating magnetic field as this value, maybe I want to rotate my qubit that I care about a little bit in the opposite direction to compensate for this magnetic field value. That, that would be a small rotation, and a small rotation is not a 90-degree rotation, so automatically it's not Clifford anymore. So there are things that are not covered by this, but a really, really, really large thing, a space of possibilities is covered. Yeah. Yes? Ah, yes, yes. So the, point, the whole point is um, this is here about quantum error correction in the sense of I, I will produce uh, logical uh, states. I will then uh, preserve them by detecting and maybe correcting and so on. Eventually, I will also have to uh, apply logical gates. And it's at this point that uh, because eventually to run a quantum algorithm with quantum advantage, as you realize, you have to have more than Clifford. Then people have to do these extra tricks like uh, preparing magic states, which, so to speak, is the 45-degree rotation and so on. And so this point is a little bit more tricky, yeah? But the, the bare quantum error correction already works with the Cliffords, yeah? And that is not in, in contradiction with having a quantum advantage. It's just a part of the whole machinery. But you're right, so the whole quantum algorithm better have some non-Clifford gates, otherwise uh, I would just run my little laptop <laughs> in order to get the results. <laughs> yes, uh, there was a question. Okay. Yeah, but all the surface code, quantum error correction, and any codes, what people do, that, that's based on the Clifford gates. Okay. So now an important thing in every reinforcement learning is, of course, constructing the reward. So as I told you, there are some errors that can happen. And basically, I want to make sure that any error that can happen, when I send my logical qubits over this quantum noise channel, I would be able to correct. And uh, Nil and Raflam figured out how to, how to make sure that this happens. And so uh, the, the kinds of things you have to test for is if I have, say, my qubit in a logical state one, and my qubit in a logical state uh, one and in a logical state zero. And then I apply an error operator, say E alpha, onto this state, and another error operator, E beta, on this state. I should not emerge at the same states. They should still be distinguishable. It's the same thing that I already explained in the recoverable quantum information. So this overlap was zero initially before the errors. It should remain zero after the errors. That's Nilla Flamm, and then there is a few more of these conditions. Yeah? 
So you go through all the error operators. For each of them, you check these nil flam conditions. And if the condition is fulfilled, then we say we set a variable k to zero for this particular error, and otherwise one. And then I construct my reward by just summing up all these zeros or ones. And the best thing I can have is that all the errors can be detected, then all these k will be zero, then the reward will be zero. Otherwise, I will get a negative reward, so that's bad. And I even snuck in some probabilities. So you can imagine that we have probabilities for these errors to happen. That's not required when I'm sure that I can correct all the errors, but imagine a situation where I'm technically not able to correct all the errors. Then I want to do a compromise, and I want to focus on the errors that are most likely. So that's why I also multiply by the probabilities. Okay, so that's my reward. And I can check this reward at any moment in time while I'm constructing my, my circuit. Um, so that was one important ingredient. So first the stabilizer, so first the good reward, and then I now come to the stabilizer simulator. So uh, if you look around on the internet, uh, the go-to stabilizer simulator is called STIM by some guy at Google. Um, and we also used that initially. But then you realize uh, STIM was invented for a a uh, situation where you just run your big quantum circuit once on many, many qubits and figure out the results. But in reinforcement learning and machine learning in general, you often want to do batches. Yeah? We want to run many agents in par parallel and so on. So you, we want to vectorize things, parallelize things. And so we did that using JAX. And so now we have our own little parallelized special purpose JAX stabilizer simulator, which is really, depending on the numbers, maybe 50 times faster than STEM. And so that really helped us a lot to explore much faster. Yeah? And, and it's out there on GitHub, so you can also use it. It's not as powerful as STEM in some other regards that we don't use, but it's good for this purpose. OK, and so some results. Um, so you run it, and you find stabilizer codes. And now you can distinguish according to the number of physical qubits, the number of logical qubits, also the so-called code distance, which teaches you how many errors you can correct. So for example, a code distance of three means you can correct one error. Um, and yeah, for different numbers of logical qubits, of course, you need different number of physical qubits. If you want more logical qubits, you need more. Also, the circuit size increases if you have more logical qubits or physical qubits. And each of these points is not even just a single code that you discover. It's really a large family of codes. And then what's highlighted here is some, some sub-parts of this family. For example, the 9-qubit Shaw code would be sitting here in this little box. Okay, But as I said, it also discovers these encoding circuits. And they will depend on the connectivity and the gate set that you give it. And that's just one of the encoding circuits uh, that it discovered for 17 qubits. So you can go up to 20 qubits. And if you only want distance 3, then it's really just seconds that it can do this. Uh, if you want a larger distance, that, then it's more, more complicated, of course. And we have applied many different optimizations by now. There is different classes of uh, codes. There are so-called CSS codes that are very close to classical codes, yeah, and that uh, can be done even more efficiently because they have a certain structure. So you can play many games. Um, so there's one other interesting aspect here. Um, and this is also very general for reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, you could either set yourself a very particular problem, like solving a particular maze, a particular labyrinth, or you could say, I want to train an agent that can deal with any labyrinth. Yeah? And here, in this case, we said, maybe I want to train an agent that could deal with any kinds of noise models. In the simplest case, it would just mean that for example, the probabilities to have the X flip versus the Z flip um, are different. And I can change these probabilities. And then what I can do is either for each choice, I train a new agent. That's possible. Or I say I have an agent that also gets as input some specification of the noise model, like, for example, the error probabilities. And then is trained randomly sometimes on this noise model, sometimes that. And eventually it becomes a kind of, you could call it a meta-agent that knows how to deal with all possible noises. 
And why would we do this? Well, the reason is because then maybe it trains a bit more efficiently, yeah? because it can maybe reuse things it has learned for this noise model also in another situation. And so that's shown here. So the horizontal axis is this kind of noise parameter, so the ratio basically of the error probabilities. Um, and the uh, vertical axis is the actual total logical failure probability uh, given a relatively high physical error probability. So of course, if you reduce that, it gets better. Uh, and what we see is first it evolves in some way, uh, but the orange line is this meta agent that was trained simultaneously on all possible different noise configurations. Whereas these uh, purple uh, spots, they are agents that were only trained on particular choices of the noise. And well, in some areas of parameter range, they are sort of similar, but you see these uh, versions where the, where the agents that were only trained on this particular parameter value did not perform as well. And we tried to make a fair comparison. So the total amount of training used for the orange curve is the same as the total amount of training used for all these purple spots together. Okay, so, th so that's interesting. And that comes up again and again. You can train agents on a specific model or you can train more powerful agents on, on many choices of situations. Okay, and if you want to try it out, <laughs> uh, you can go to this GitHub of John, uh, the postdoc who did this. Okay, good. So then let me go on. Now, there's the question, what happens if during the encoding I also get errors? And that's really one of the big issues in quantum computing. Because you know, um, here maybe I have a single physical qubit error. I would be able to correct this with this code, let's say, no problem. And if I apply a single qubit gate, maybe this error gets transformed. So if it was a kind of Z-flip error initially, it gets transformed in an X-flip, but no, no worries, it's still one error. However, once I apply a controlled knot, this error will propagate because the source qubit uh, will now affect the target qubit, and that's bad. So suddenly I have two errors. The errors have spread. And that's really bad because, say, in this particular code, I cannot correct two errors anymore. So in my attempt to create a logical qubit, I'm failing, I'm, I'm completely failing, yeah? Because uh, the single physical qubit error will translate into two, physical, into two errors and I cannot correct them anymore. And so this is a general problem, yeah? So because uh, I will always have some complicated quantum circuit with two qubit gates, I will have this error propagation. So if I did nothing against this, uh, I would be better off just keeping my single physical qubit, actually. So this is the question of fault tolerance, so preventing proliferation of errors. And so there are several strategies that uh, people have invented, and one of the most recent ones is um, um, the so-called flag strategy. So what you do is you introduce an extra ancilla qubit, and you let it couple in a smart way to the original qubits, such that if you do have the ancilla qubit flipped, and you measure it in, this, in the end to determine whether it was flipped, then it flags the fact that there is now an unrecoverable error. So you have too many errors around in your circuit. You will not be able to correct them even later. And so you should try again. So basically, you run this uh, preparation. If the flag qubit doesn't say anything, you know you are good. If it does say something, you know you are bad, and you should just re restart the whole logical qubit preparation. And so now this has been worked out by hand for a few situations, for a few codes. But the question is, how do we do this in general? And can we use reinforcement learning to discover it for unknown uh, situations? And so th these are the people working on this. Uh, Remy Tsen was the first order, and then there's this whole team, including in particular a good collaboration with Markus Müller in Aachen. Okay, and so we tried out several approaches, but the one that worked best is if we just um, 
say the following. Here you apply your little quantum circuit whose task it is to prepare the logical quantum state. You will target a particular logical state, for example, one of those discovered by the reinforcement learning that I described 10 minutes ago. And then you add a few ancillas. And what you will want to have is first, the distance to the target state should be small in the end, okay? But also all the errors that would be harmful should get flagged, yeah? Uh, plus an extra condition so the data qubits and the flag qubits are in a product state because otherwise also it's, it would be bad, but that's another condition, okay? And so, again, you use stabilizer simulators and so on, so you use the same machinery and you see what happens. And so we got very nice results. So for example, um, here's just examples of certain qubit connectivities that I think were taken from Google devices. Um, and you will set aside a few ancillas. These are the blue ones here uh, as flag qubits. And uh, a few of the qubits were even unused. And then it optimizes this reward by going through the user reinforcement learning. And what I'm not even discussing here, we are typically using PPO, and that's an actor-critic method, and it has both a policy network and it also has a value network. Yeah? So these, uh, whatever we feed in into the policy network, like these <laughs> uh, binary matrices representing the stabilizers, we will also feed into the value network and so on. So it's the whole machinery behind it. Yeah? And so here are the results. So uh, depending on what you're targeting, either you are as good as existing human-made solutions, or if you're targeting interesting states like the 513, which is the smallest uh, uh, code that can correct arbitrary errors, uh, then actually we found significantly better solutions than what exists. So what exists is a 20 physical, uh, sorry, a, a solution with 20 two-qubit gates we bring it down to 12 two-qubit gates. They needed six flag qubits. We can do with two flag qubits. So it really shows that reinforcement learning is helpful. Also, we discovered that transfer learning helps. So for example, you have trained it um, on a fully connected uh, qubit uh, setup. And then you switch off some of the possible actions. So you go to a more restricted connectivity. So some of the actions are no longer possible. And then you continue training on this new situation. And that's what's shown here in orange. So continuing training on the modified situation is better than training from scratch in this modified situation. So that's helpful, yeah? So you can train on some situation, you go to a new situation, you do not delete the neural network, it really works. Okay. And so here's a very recent result from a few weeks ago. We can go to this relatively large already surface 17 code, so 17 qubits in total, and then ask for logical state preparation. And it is able to do this. And as far as we understand, no one had found such a, a flag uh, qubit uh, preparation strategy before. OK, so apparently it works. And so now with this combination of smart rewards and uh, stabilizer simulations, we've been going far beyond these four or five qubits that we had. Um, okay, and again, there's GitHub. <laughs> you can just play around with it and maybe discover interesting <laughs> strategies on your own by running this agent. Any questions about this? Hey, I don't see any. I think we still have 20 minutes or so, that's what I guess, yes. Okay, so so far I was uh, talking about training and simulations. This was all done on simulations. Um, and you could then deploy it in experiments. But what about training directly on experiments? And uh, there are big challenges. So first, you need to be able to extract the reward from the experiment. So you cannot do this recoverable quantum information or these fancy things because you do not have access to it in the experiment. Plus, also, if you do have feedback, and this is the interesting cases, you need to provide this feedback quite quickly. So your neural network needs to take in the measurement results and then, say, in a microsecond, has to answer what should be the next action. So you cannot just run it on your uh, GPU or so, so you really have to be fast. 
And so he, here's something where we got together with uh, people in Zurich, so I would say the, the leading superconducting qubit team in Europe, uh, Andreas Walraff's team, and especially Christopher Eichler, and they worked together with us on doing, for the first time, experimental reinforcement learning with this real-time feedback uh, in this context on the superconducting qubit system. So what had existed was people using reinforcement learning, for example, for gate design for superconducting qubits, but that's something where you don't need feedback, you just run it even on the cloud, and you try out different gate sequences until you converge to something that works nicely. People had also used it for quantum dot tune-up, so you uh, go to certain voltages in your quantum dot setup, you measure the current, then you go to other voltages and so on, but that's really slow, and again, it doesn't need real-time feedback. So the setting we have here is a single qubit, because we have to start simple, not, not five, not 17, just a single qubit. Um, you measure that single qubit in the usual way that these superconducting qubits are measured. You have a microwave cap cavity coupled to it, you send a microwave signal through it, you get a very noisy measurement trace, and then you have to decide what this means for the state of the qubit. You're feeding this measurement result into a neural network, and the neural network then has to decide uh, to suggest uh, next action, which would be a single qubit gate. So for example, the qubit is flipped from up to down, or if the qubit is really treated like a three-level system because that's more realistic, maybe you also have other gates available. And the task we set was very simple, just ground state preparation. Because if you just let it sit there, it will have a, a few thermal occupations, uh, so ground state preparation. So you want to be fast, and one of the ways to go fast is to implement, instead of on a GPU, you implement it on a so-called field programmable gate array, which is almost like as if you can program a little chip, which then does what you want it to do. This is some technology that people were using anyway in these kinds of setups for uh, understanding the measurement result, but that's a very simple, <laughs> A simple thing, you integrate uh, up the noisy measurement uh, trace and then you do a threshold uh, and depending on whether you are up uh, below or above, you say it's uh, up or down, yeah? But we implemented the neural network on the FPGA and there was lots of thinking about how to optimize it, all the multiplications and additions, uh, fighting for every nanosecond, so <laughs> that's something that the uh, experimental PhD, Kevin Royer, and my PhD student, Jonas Landgraf, can tell you more about it. I wasn't even involved in counting the individual nanoseconds. <laughs> but then there was also an interesting architectural idea, and that came, again, from Thomas Fösel mostly. So um, usually when you have a neural network, you feed the input into the input layer, then you compute layer by layer the usual combination of linear and nonlinear uh, functions, and then you get to the output, and you announce the output. But that would be slow, so each uh, step from layer to layer takes some time. And so what we decided instead was to change things a little bit. So what we say is, while the measurement data is still coming in, the string of continuous values that represent the voltage versus time, we start feeding the first few nanoseconds of this measurement results into the input layer, then we take one step of calculation, and then we feed the next few nanoseconds of measurement trace into the next layer. And again and again, so while the input data is still coming in, also the network is already doing its computation. Now this is, there's a price to pay. Uh, in particular, the last pieces of measurement data will only be fed into the last layers, and so the computation being done on them cannot be very complex, it's just maybe a single layer. But it's good enough, the performance is really good. And so what this whole structure means is that we're only adding 50 nanoseconds to the latency by having the neural network because all the rest is still the measurement, so to speak. The measurement takes a few hundred nanoseconds and we are not wasting any time because while the measurement is going on, the network is also doing its calculation. Okay. So it's a little bit similar to LSTM recurrent networks, but it's still different because in an LSTM network, uh, for each new time signal that comes in, you would use the same neural network structure to calculate what's the output. Here, uh, the computational power is shrinking as time goes on, but it's good enough. Okay, and so that works. It has a microsecond uh, cycle time. It's really fast. We believe it's the fastest uh, neural network agent that exists currently. 
as far as we know, at least published. <laughs> um, so the se second fastest th th that I know of was for some um, plasma physics control, but that's 100 times slower. Okay, and then once you run it, you really do it in the following way. You, you let it uh, run for, I don't know, a few hundred times or so on the real experiment. It collects the actions and the rewards and so on. And then it sends all of this to a PC. On the PC, there's another copy of the neural network. The PC then applies, say, the PPO learning algorithm from stable baselines or whatever. It updates the neural network parameters because that part doesn't need to have to be incredibly fast. What has to be fast is the feedback loop. Yeah? And so then after this update has happened, you download the neural network parameters to the FPGA, and then it can go on for the next thousand trajectories, and then it uploads to the PC that it updates the parameters and so on. And so after running this for three minutes and many thousands of trajectories, you have a fully trained agent. And so that's really nice to see. And so then you can analyze the strategy if you like. Yeah? So you can say for a given input, what does the agent suggest in terms of actions? And now that's a little bit tricky because the input remembers this very noisy measurement trace, so it's a high dimensional vector. So how do I even <laughs> plot the action as a function of input? But what I can do is to visualize, I can take this high dimensional vector and say integrate it and integrate it with some weight function. And so I get moments, if you like, of this vector. And then I can take two of these and plot in the two-dimensional space, and that's already good enough for visualization. So what I'm showing here is, so to speak, in each of these panels is the probability for a certain action. For example, here is the action of flipping from the second excited state down to the ground state, because here we are treating a three-level system to make it more interesting. Second excited state going down to the ground state. What's the probability for suggesting this action? Depending on the input, yeah? And the input is, um, visualized in terms of these two coordinates, even though it is higher dimensional, of course. And so here you see, oh, there's a certain area where the agent says, no, it would be time to flip from the second excited state down to the ground state. And there are other areas where other actions will be preferred. Yeah? So you can analyze all of this. And again, it's completely model free. So it could be my qubit is not properly calibrated, other funny things are happening, the signal gets distorted, and so on it will adapt to all of this. Okay. Any questions about this? So we were very happy when, once this worked. <laughs> yes? Ah, okay. So, so on the most basic level, it's just a standard fully collected neural network that takes as input a measurement trace. So if this is time, and this is, say, the voltage that I measure, it's uh, discretized. I will have a very noisy trace. So this then uh, will turn into the input vector. So all of these values will go into the uh, input layer neurons. And then the only thing it has to calculate is a policy network. It has to calculate uh, action probabilities. So uh, one of these action probabilities would be the flip from the second excited level to the E. And another would be, I don't know, E to G. And another would be the action probability for doing nothing idle, which is also interesting. Maybe there's another termination action that says, OK, now I think I have prepared things in the ground state. So please, uh, <laughs> here's the ground state. So this is a usual policy network. Um, and the only trick that I mentioned here was in order to save time, uh, while it's doing its computation layer by layer in the usual manner, um, I'm still injecting input. So for example, some of the neurons in the first hidden layer, some of these neurons, will be actually set aside to receive new input. That's unconventional. That doesn't happen in a normal neural network. Yeah? Normally, they all just receive input from the input layer, then I calculate these values, then I calculate the next values, then I calculate those. But a few of these neurons will be initialized according to some of these um, voltages. Yeah, it's a little bit funny. Ah, yeah, so the, exactly. So the length of the input layer is maybe just the first few voltages in this case. 
Plus, also, we put in some summary information about earlier measurements and so, so, uh, some tricks. But um, yes, so it's not the full trace in that case. Yeah. OK, so these are little tricks. Um, also, yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, that was TensorFlow, actually. And I just was about to mention that, um, I mean, it was, on the PC, it was developed using TensorFlow, yeah? And then um, when it was programmed on FPGA, I don't even remember what uh, detailed technical language they were using, but this was all implemented then by hand, which is not difficult for a fully connected neural network. If I don't even want to train it, just want to execute it, it's just multiplications and additions and applying a sigmoid function or some nonlinear activation function. But one of the interesting pieces is such an FPGA does not do floating point arithmetic, so it does fixed point arithmetic where you have to decide how many digits you have after the comma and in front of the comma. And one of the benefits of TensorFlow is actually you can tell it to please try this neural network in fixed point arithmetic. So already on the PC you can check whether the accuracy is good enough even though you're using this fixed point arithmetic. So these are the little details there. Okay, so uh, maybe in the last few minutes, I uh, want to show you something where we went to really many qubits. Yeah? And that's work, again, with Thomas Fösel and some Google research team. Uh, so the motivation is when we have these near-term, intermediate-scale quantum devices, well, their qubit numbers are already pretty large, like 50, 100, or something like this. Um, so can we do anything with reinforcement learning there? Well, I told you there's these cases where you have Clifford simulators available. That's one possibility. But here's another possibility. So if we set ourselves the task to optimize a given quantum circuit, then we can also do something smart. So suppose you have compiled a quantum algorithm exactly into a certain circuit. You are sure that it does what it should do, but it's maybe a little bit too large. Maybe you want to shrink it because every additional gate and qubit and so on uh, will result in more errors huh, because it needs more time. So you want to shrink, you want to optimize the circuit. And so here's something you can do. Uh, there are exact transformation rules. For example, you know that these four C naughts together are exactly the same as these two C naughts. Yeah? We can just prove it. And so if I give you a big quantum circuit, you can try to identify little building blocks like these four C naughts, which may be present, and replace them by the two C naughts. And the good thing is, you do not need to recalculate what the circuit does. If you guarantee me that the circuit did the right thing in the beginning, and even after applying the transformation, it will still do the right thing. So that avoids completely the need to simulate. Okay. And so what we set out to do is, was to train one agent that can optimize any circuit. Again, this game could be played in many different ways. You could say, here I have one circuit. Let me do reinforcement learning to optimize this one particular circuit. So in the end, I will have an agent that is able to optimize only this circuit. And the next circuit, I train again. But here, we wanted to train an agent that can take an arbitrary circuit and then suggest uh, simplifications. OK. And so this is the pipeline again. You know these <laughs> graphs by now. Uh, so the agent will suggest an action, which is really a saying, oh, at this point, uh, please apply this transformation rule number five. And then the circuit has changed. And the circuit should go into the agent as an observation. So we also have to figure out how to represent uh, the circuit. And this is something I, I'm showing here. There are possibly many ways. It could be, for example, represented as a graph. Uh, but what we did was to represent it like a color picture. So it's like a two-dimensional image, obviously. <laughs> One dimension being which qubit I'm looking at, and the other dimension is time. And then there's a third, let's say, channel dimension, uh, which I uh, use to encode which gate I have. So at this location in space and time, I have a Hadama, or I have a C naught, say, going up to the next qubit, or a C naught going down to the previous qubit. 
So this was good enough for this purpose to encode it as an image. That goes then into the agent. And the agent has to make an output again. Uh, okay, again, there will be a value network and a policy network, but let's focus on the policy network. So the policy network, again, has this two-dimensional structure. And now the different channels means different transformation rules. Yeah? So please, at this spot, with this probability, apply transformation rule number three. And with that probability, at another spot, apply another transformation rule. And then you sample from all of these, and you will most likely pick the ones with the highest probabilities and apply these transformation rules. And then there comes the question, how do you even train? In principle, you could give me a lot of compiled quantum algorithms, and I try to improve them. But what we found, but there's only a limited amount of them and so on. Yeah. What we found uh, better was to work with random circuits. So what Thomas in this case did, he just generated random quantum circuits. Then he even applied random transformations, which when applied randomly have the tendency to blow up the circuit actually. And then he feeds this really long, terribly inefficient quantum circuit into the agent and asks the agent to apply the transformation rules to become better again. And so the agent is able to learn this and one advantage is that when you do it like this, you already know, you have a kind of benchmark because the initial circuit is already shorter, so you should at least reach this, maybe become even better. Okay. And so I, I don't go through the details, but um, you can apply it. So first you can train on relatively smallish quantum circuits, and then you can apply it to much larger circuits because you have a convolutional network agent. So if it works on a small image, it also works on a large image. And so that works very nicely here, for example, shown for 50 qubits. In the background in gray, you have a randomly chosen uh, circuit uh, that is not yet, uh, uh, that is still unoptimized. And then in blue, you have the circuit that the agent produced after looking at this and applying its transformation rules. And then I still want to say something about the efficiency. Um, you want to compare against something. And a very general technique for solving such optimization tasks would be simulated annealing. So basically, you're picking these transformation rules a little bit at random. Uh, but then you decrease some temperature, and then you only apply those transformation rules that would actually shrink the circuit, preferentially. Um, but the point is, if you apply this to a circuit of that size, uh, to reach this level of performance, you would need something on the order of a week, actually. And that's comparable to the full training time for the general reinforcement learning agent, which afterwards can be relatively quick in optimizing any particular circuit. So once you do more than one circuit, it already pays off. Okay, I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Florian, for this uh, great uh, lecture series. Um, are there still some questions, final questions from your side that you have? Or are you happy? <laughs> it's like everyone is happy. That's good. <laughs> and now it's time for lunch and at 2 or 2.15, 2.15, uh, we will meet again with the final lecture from uh, Filippo Vicentini. But for the moment, let's thank Florian again for this fantastic series. Applause.